what I was going to do was just to sort of give you a, an introduction to, to the POTS side of things um, and was just going to give you um, a little welcome at the start. Obviously, from my perspective, uh, I would thank all of you for coming. Um, I think it's, it's uh, quite amazing that there are so many people who have actually put their hands up and said that you're interested in POTS uh, and EDS um, because actually it's quite a difficult thing, I'm sure. Um, that many of you have uh, discovered that to say, actually, I'm interested in this area. Um, I'd also like to thank the POTS UK people. They, it's, it's been very kind of them to put my name on all of this stuff, but they've done 99.9% .9 of the work. All of the extremely eminent faculty are here because of them, not because of me. Um, obviously, we're going to be very interested in feedback at the end of all of this because we, we ran this sort of meeting a couple of years ago where about 30 people came to the National um, and... Obviously, we need to have feedback about what works, what doesn't work, what would you like us to do if we do this again in a couple of years' time? Um, and are there other things that we should be doing? So, um, why am I here? Why am I standing up in front of you lot? What gives me the right? Well, um, absolutely nothing. Um, I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist, so I have an interest in funny heart rhythms, and I just got interested in all of these people with dizzy spells and blackouts and palpitations, and it just appeared that an awful lot of them had POTS and inappropriate sinus tachycardia, and it also became clear that there wasn't a lot of uh, help out there, and I just sort of fell into this, um, and the more I've been interested and involved in it, the more interesting and fascinating it has become. So my, my involvement is just being interested and uh, trying to break through these myths that POTS is a made-up condition that only affects hysterical nurses. Um, and essentially, I've just been around the place and asked lots of questions and asked people like Bob uh, and his colleague Satish Raj um, about what is this POTS business and how do I treat it. So my involvement in all of this is just that I've asked lots of questions and I've seen a few people with this condition. Um, so it all relates to orthostatic intolerance. I'm sure you're aware that it's all about the fact that we stand on two legs and our head is higher than our heart and therefore we need a system to keep plump, pumping blood upwards and there are a number of conditions where that doesn't quite work. Um, and the ones over on the right hand side that relates to vasovagal syncope so this is where the whole system generally works all right and then suddenly takes a short holiday every now and again um, when you're standing on the tube wearing five coats in the middle of July and wonder why you feel faint. And then there's the lot over here um, on, on your right-hand side, which is the autonomic failures, obviously, um, where my colleague Shane Delamont and other autonomic neurologists uh, come in, where the whole system stops working. Uh, and then, obviously, the, the bit that I'm interested in um, and, and hopefully you're interested in, which is the pot side of things. Now, this comes from a review article um, that was written quite some while ago, and you can see they've tried to split it apart into various primary and secondary conditions. I'm not sure that necessarily I quite agree with the way that it's divided there now, but as we don't really know what the condition is, it becomes quite difficult to split it up. But I think it's a, an important point to remember, uh, perhaps yourself when you're seeing people in clinics, but also when you're talking to other people, that this is a syndrome. And therefore, because it's a syndrome, it's likely to be a collection of conditions and diseases and abnormalities and therefore they're not all going to be the same we can't say that this is angina and therefore it's going to be something that we recognize that I can do the same thing to all of these hundreds of people and it will always come out the same so it's like heart failure there are many many things that cause heart failure and that you wouldn't necessarily expect that if a fast heart rate produces heart failure that Ablation is the perfect treatment, but that ablation would treat any of the other things. So remember that it's a syndrome. Um, I'm not going to say very much about inappropriate sinus tachycardia, although you will find that in, in some of the literature people try to split it apart, but I'm not entirely convinced that they are truly different conditions. Uh, but just to, um, to emphasise, as Bob said, he, he chaired the group writing the guidelines um, and there, you'll see lots of guideline slides during my presentation. So there, there, there is an eminent document written by very eminent people summarising what is known uh, and what is not known uh, about the area and there's, there's uh, a section on there about inappropriate sinus tachycardia. So from the POTS perspective, I'm sure you're all very aware 
um, that there are a number of definitions and, and this is as good as any in the most recent. So when you stand up, your heart rate goes up by more than 30 beats a minute. Um, or if you're a teenager, by more than 40 beats a minute. Um, and that it's associated with symptoms. And that when you um, do a tilt table test or an active stand, you can see uh, as over on uh, your left hand side, the blue line up at the top, the heart rate increases as patients stand. It was first described, they say, by Jacob Mendes de Costa in 1871 in American Civil War Soldiers. I'm sure that it's clearly been around for many hundreds of years, but it's been generally ignored. It was described again in First World War soldiers. Of course, it is interesting that it was described in young men, because, of course, it's much more common in young women. But uh, as you're well aware, young women are basically barking mad hysterics who make up symptoms. So therefore, they can't possibly have anything wrong with them. So for the whole of the 20th century, as medicine developed and we discovered lots of interesting things like DNA, this was a psychiatric condition. And it's only really in the, the latter part of the 20th century where a number of select loons said, actually, I think there might be something physically wrong with this lot. And that obviously led on to the American Autosonomic Society defining it as a condition. And then obviously sub subsequently HRS and colleagues producing their guidelines. Um, how much of it is there about? Well, nobody knows. Um, again, as, as we were hearing, the, um, the epidemiological studies would be very helpful. Some people say 170 per 100,000, um, so actually that's quite a lot. Um, so that equates roughly to about 1 in 500, which is the same incidence as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I'm sure that if you work in uh, most hospitals, there will be a cardiologist who professes to have a specialist clinic or to have some interest in HCM. So, you know, they, they've got a huge number of patients and a huge number of physicians, uh, and um, we don't. It's a lot more common in women. Um, it tends to be a younger person's problem, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is exclusively. There is a family history, and maybe that is something to do with the hypermobility. Often people will su suggest that it starts with an event, and that might be viral illness, and glandular fever is clearly classical in the area, but in my experience, it can be many, many things, a road traffic accident, an operation, um, an anaesthetic, a vaccination, um, something seems to set off the process. I, I like this quote, it just, just came to me while I was putting the talk together last night, I mean, it's got absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about, but they were, they were talking, this is all from the Lord of the Rings, and they're talking about the story of the ring, so a part of this tale was known to some there, but the full tale to no one. Um, basically, that's Potts. We all know tiny little bits, and there are eminent people who will talk during the rest of the morning and afternoon who know their little bit, but actually the full understanding of the whole thing, nobody tr quite understands. Um, there are lots of thoughts about what might cause it, and Alan has sort of covered um, a lot of these, and um, I've summarised them again, and there's a, a recent review article that goes through a few. So it's a mixture of, as you've heard, deconditioning and neuropathies um, and abnormal adrenaline control and hypermobility and autoimmunity and mast cell issues. And it may be many different things in many different people, which is why it's difficult to clarify and difficult to classify and why when we discuss with our colleagues and then say, yeah, but I gave that drug and it worked for person A and it, therefore it didn't work for person B and therefore it's all a lie is probably because it's lots of different conditions. Um, so the sort of things that people will describe, I'm sure that you've heard it many, many times. There's a bunch of cardiac symptoms, and obviously that's why an awful lot of people who get involved in POTS uh, have a cardiology interest. So chest pain, breathlessness, palpitations, dizzy spells, blackouts, ankle swelling. Um, and then there's all of the other bits and pieces that we've heard about. So all the bowel symptoms that Professor Aziz will talk about, bladder symptoms, migraines, as we've heard, uh, sleep disturbance. And Obviously, this is part of the problem for our general or non-specialist colleagues who will say it's not possible to have a condition at your age with all of these symptoms. Um, so therefore, it, you must be making it up. You must be hysterical. Um, but we recognize it, and you only need to see a small number of POTS patients to hear that actually they keep saying exactly the same things. So the idea is that they have a group of symptoms, 
a lot of them cardiovascular, and that in general, to get the diagnosis, we expect the symptoms to have been present for six months. Obviously, we do see classical POTS patients um, who've uh, uh, had their symptoms for a much shorter time, um, and I don't really know what we call them, but they've obviously got some acute, subtle, uh, autonomic disturbance. Um, but to, to, to call it officially POTS, I suppose we need to, to stick to the six months. The critical part of all of it relates to the symptoms and the fact that they feel unwell standing up. So it's not about a number. Cardiologists, are, we, we love scans and we love numbers and we love tests and I want a test that tells me this is the answer and that's not the answer. And unfortunately it's not like that. But the most critical part of all of this is the pe what the patient says and the fact that they have symptoms when they stand up and they say they don't like standing up. So symptoms are very important. Obviously, the effect on um, the patient's life is also very important, and this comes from a, uh, uh, a questionnaire study that Leslie and colleagues put together, um, and you can find it in the uh, British Journal of Cardiology, um, really showing how significant POTS can be on the, um, producing effects on, on people's lives. So, if we've managed to see a patient and we think, yeah, actually you sound like you've got the sort of thing that we're interested in, what should we do? Should we do some tests? So if we look at the guidelines, um, the guidelines have, have looked at what can we say on the basis of evidence. Uh, and we can't really say very much on the basis of evidence. So actually what you do in your clinic, uh, when you say, actually, I think you've got POTS, um, you know, what test can I do? You're right as well as I'm right because we don't really know what to do. We know that taking a history uh, and doing an examination and getting the patient to stand up and measuring their heart rate um, certainly is a, a worthwhile thing to do. And we might check a couple of blood tests, but actually all of the complicated stuff, nobody knows whether it's worthwhile doing it or not. Personally, as a cardiologist, I think it's worthwhile doing it because it makes me feel better um, and it makes me sh sort of more certain, I suppose, that I'm not missing a, a cardiac condition. So these are the sort of tests that I do. Um, I know that we've had discussions with, with colleagues in the past to say, well, I couldn't possibly do all of those tests. Uh, and yeah, that's absolutely fine. I think you have to do in a way what you feel comfortable with to suggest, yes, I've, I've excluded the things that I want to exclude. Now, we've done... Um, all of these tests essentially on, on essentially everybody who we've ever seen over the last decade, Shane and I. Um, and, you know, I hope that at some point we may be able to go back and look through the data and, and see what it all means. But um, the critical part of um, the whole process is the tilt table test. And I would emphasise that, uh, that personally I think that it's very important that you use beat to beat blood pressure. So the Phenopress or other systems are available which gives you uh, the sort of trend like this so that you've got two red lines, the systolic and the diastolic, and then you've got the green line here, which is the heart rate. You'll see two different formats on these slides. When somebody just measures the heart rate and the blood pressure every five minutes, you're going to miss an awful lot of the nuance of the patient's autonomics. Um, and so doing the beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure is very important. And that's normal. Um, if, we, if I just go back, you can see that the green line is, yeah, it's wibbly-wobbly and it's up and down, but it's, it's generally flat. This patient's heart rate really didn't go up when they stood up for 10 minutes. Sometimes you'll just get this sort of thing, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's words, it's numbers. Does that really give you an impression of what went on? Um, our pictures are much better, and this is a... Um, a, a heart rate blood pressure trace for a patient with POTS. You can see that, again, you've got the two red lines and you've got the blue line this time for heart rate. And you can see that when the patient stands up, their heart rate does go up. These are um, 50 and 100. So the, all of the big squares are 50 beats per minute. So you can see that there's a significant 35 beat per minute increase. And it gives you a, a, a very nice, um, actually immediately accessible vision of what's gone on. So I, I, w I would emphasize, I think, that it's very important. Now, you can get your patients to measure their own heart rates at home and do a 10-minute active stand at home and get them to measure their heart rate blood pressure every minute lying flat and then standing up for 10 minutes and write down their symptoms. And that can be a, a very helpful way that they can then bring you some data because, of course, it changes. But I think that's very helpful. Um, <laughs> 
un unfortunately, because of the way that the guidelines have been written, they've been written as it goes up by 30 beats a minute. If it's more than 30 beats a minute, you've got pots. And there are a number of articles and uh, letters and so forth in the journals which say, ah, yes, but I found a patient who went up by 35 beats per minute and they didn't have any symptoms. Or, um, you know, sort of subject along that sort of line. So they say, well, we we'll need to get it more then. We need to increase it to 40, to 50, to whatever you fancy. But I think that sort of misses the point that it's... Um, you know, we, mu we c mustn't get into this idea that there is something magic about the 30 beats a minute. And if it's more than 30 beats a minute, you've got a condition. But if it's 29, you're wasting my time and you're mad. So, so remember, it's a qualitative assessment that, yes, the heart rate goes up and, yes, they have symptoms. So we have to remember, um, I think, that to, to think about it, that there is a, a lot of people out there who are fainty. And then there's a smaller number of those people who we will call or the orthostatically intolerant, so people who don't like standing up. Um, and then there's a proportion of those who have POTS. So they formally fulfil criteria. But just because they have a heart rate increase of more than 30 doesn't mean that we should ignore the orthostatically intolerant. And if we throw in hypermobility, um, actually there's enormous amounts, in my experience, overlap between all of these uh, people. So there's quite a lot of fainty people who are bendy and quite a lot of the orthostatically intolerant who are bendy. Uh, and actually whether an awful lot of the people that we treat formally fulfil criteria for POTS and whether actually we're, we're treating more orthostatic intolerance is, uh, is a question. And um, Bob's uh, colleague Satish um, published this where they were looking at is the tilt the right thing to do or is the active stand the right thing to do? And they're obviously slightly different physiologically. But what they did was that they admitted the patients overnight and tested them the following morning when they hadn't had anything to eat or drink and they'd stopped all their drugs. I'm sure that your tilt service doesn't admit people the night before. But they did that obviously very specifically to control the circumstances to produce that 30 beats a minute. So is it a surprise that when we do it on a cold November afternoon in Denmark Hill, that it may not necessarily come up with that 30 beats a minute. So I think, remember, qualitative. This um, is a patient who has hypermobility and orthostatic intolerance. So she hates standing up. Uh, and her heart rate goes up, but it doesn't go up by 30. But you can see the, the heart rate's very variable, and it carries on from the top and then down to the bottom. And the blood pressure's all over the place, swinging up and down. And obviously, it produces the symptoms. So it's not all about heart rate. So you have to listen to the patient. It's also not all about fainting. So here's a, a neurocardiogenic episode, a faint at the end with the heart rate going up and then both heart rate and blood pressure plummeting. But they don't have to. There's, you're, you're, you may see a lot of letters out there. Ah, oh, yes, their blood pressure dropped. Their blood pressure didn't drop. It has to be therefore be POTS or not. They didn't faint, therefore it is POTS. They did faint, it isn't POTS. Fainting's got nothing to do with it. So tilt table testing or active standing is very important. Um, Heart rate monitoring we find to be very helpful and we look at the heart rate trend. Obviously, we want to make sure that the patient doesn't have an arrhythmia, but we, what we often find is this inappropriate sinus tachycardia pattern. So the top two traces where the heart is just too fast. So you can see the top one, heart's always fast when the patient's up and about. Um, the middle trace, um, it's, it's not always fast, but it's very spiky. It, whenever the patient is active, it goes up too much. Whereas the one down here at the bottom on your right is much more normal. You can see, I hope, qualitatively, there's a difference. And then there's a patient with an arrhythmia where, essentially, they've got a fairly fixed heart rate all the time. And that's a focal atrial tachycardia. So the heart rate trend on that halter is very important, very helpful. Um, it's very nice that um, Steve James, our cardiothoracic anaesthetist, has, has come because he helps us with all of this stuff, this cardiopulmonary exercise testing business. Um, we started to use these because the patients come in complaining of chest pain and breathlessness and exercise intolerance. And um, so we thought that this CPEP would be a good idea. Uh, and it's very helpful and it certainly gives us a good idea if there is a cardiac or respiratory problem. But it led on to uh, the findings um, really that an awful lot of our patients hyperventilate. Um, and that seems to be almost ubiquitous uh, in our POTS patients, certainly, that they're all hyperventilating um, and not, uh, is, as is my belief, through anxiety. 
We do some blood tests, but nobody. This is just what we do, uh, but but nobody knows what the right answer is. But that's that's what we came up with. Um, you can do autonomic function tests, but um, they are very very complicated, uh, and not every centre um, does autonomic function tests. But the tilt can give you an idea. This is a patient uh, who has autonomic failure, and you can see that the blue line that the heart rate is much less variable. So there's very little heart rate variability while the patient is lying flat. Yes, the heart rate goes up, but the blood pressure very, very high before they stand up, so supine hypertension. Soon as they stand, blood pressure plummets down to about 80 over 50. So a very much different sort of trace. Um, so you can get the idea of autonomic failure. So if we've made the diagnosis, what can we do? Um, the most this is what the guidelines say, and you will see that an awful lot of this stuff is about what the consensus experts, who all see thousands and thousands of POTS patients, think is a good idea. There's not a lot out there in terms of pure evidence-based medicine. The thing to get across to our colleagues and absolutely the patients is how important the simple stuff is. You've got to make them drink water. You've got to make them add salt to the diet. And then ideally, certainly in my practice, we then prove that that's what they're doing with a 24-hour urine collection. Go on, prove it. Compression clothing, compression leggings, maybe cutting down on carbs, um, doing some exercise. All of these things are vital. Um, and I don't think actually any of the stuff works. And this is very counterintuitive to 21st century medicine, where I expect there to be a magic drug that I take and that it all, all goes away again and I don't need to do anything. Can I have my statin and my cream cake? <laughs> Exercise is important, um, and this comes from Ben Levine's group in Dallas, um, where they've shown very clearly that uh, the autonomic abnormalities on standing will improve if you exercise and if you decondition somebody they will get potsy so exercise is vital and obviously we're going to hear more about exercise coming up um, drugs drugs are difficult because there are clearly drugs that help um, but when you read a review article and there are many out there um, you will find big lists like this and the great difficulty is when you're sat in your clinic well which drug do I choose I've got no idea and the, the evidence isn't going to tell you. So a lot of the time it comes down to experience um, and also whether you feel comfortable with the medications. Um, and if you're a cardiologist or, or a cardiac specialist, you may use certain of these. And if you're a neurologist, you may use other ones. And if, um, if you know, octreotide, there are probably very few places in the UK who are going to get into octreotide for POTS. And so it, some of this becomes very difficult. And because we're dealing with a syndrome, you don't necessarily know which medicines are going to work. And of course, that makes it even more difficult for us and our colleagues because they will say, ah, yeah, but I gave bisoprolol and it didn't work. Therefore, um, uh, they don't have a condition. They're just lying. They're making it up. So I've used uh, some of these um, and uh, we've found some to be more effective than others. This comes from Satish again. Uh, remember that um, small doses of beta blocker can help people feel better, but higher doses actually seem to worsen the process as then the patients feel more fatigued and low blood pressure. So, um, and also remember, as, as Alan said, there are some medicines that make it worse and the SNRI medications uh, are said to aggravate POTS and indeed you can apparently give somebody POTS if you fancy by giving them things like duloxetine, which of course is difficult because the pain clinics like things like duloxetine for the chronic pain of hypermobility. So this is what I do. That doesn't mean it's right. It just means that this is what I do. And over the last 10 or 12 years, enough people have come back and sort of said, I, I think that one worked. I don't think that one worked. So I use midodrine first, just because on average, it seems to be the thing that helps in my practice. And then if that doesn't help, we try Evabradine or if we need something else. And then we try other things, and sometimes we'll use beta blockers, and sometimes we'll use fludrocortisone, although not too high. Um, the fludrocortisone um, seems to have an effect in the first stages, but perhaps sometimes it wears off. Salt tablets, I'd rather we didn't, but um, salt tablets, if the patients really can't get enough salt in their diet. Antihistamines, um, we, will, um, we will touch on um, 
paradistigmine I, I, I don't use, but I'm not a neurologist, so I always ask Shane. So there are people who will say POTS is the cardiovascular stuff, so only treat the POTS, but my view uh, is very much this is a multi-systemic disorder, so therefore you have to treat it as such. Because actually, if you, even if you make, make the POTSy bit better, all of the other stuff may not get better. I think this is very interesting, and uh, Charles, our consultant respiratory physio, is in the audience. Th this, is, this is the Nemegen questionnaire for hyperventilation syndrome. Uh, and you will see, and I certainly won't see on there, um, it's far too small, but chest pain and dizzy spells, and feeling confused and funny breathing and shortness of breath and tightness in the chest and tingly fingers, um, cold hands and feet palpitations. It's all a bit familiar, isn't it? I mean, those are basically POTS symptoms, or perhaps POTS is hyperventilation syndrome. So an awful lot of our patients hyperventilate, and we prove it, and they go to see Charles, and he makes them a lot better. So that's very important. A lot of them have gastro symptoms, and Professor Aziz will talk about that. Um, a lot of our patients have very large, insensate bladders, which can either mean that they can go for the whole day without passing water, uh, or that they're constantly rushing to the toilet or getting infected or... Um, having incontinence. So finding a helpful urologist who will take note of all of this and just often give very simple advice can make a difference. Um, there are neuro, there's neuro stuff, there's headaches and migraines, that's very helpful. There's funny sleep disturbance, um, there's migraine variant balance disorder. So this is where they not only describe faintness, they also said the world spins and it's, a, it's an overlap between vertigo and migraine, which again uh, seems to be very common. Hypermobility is very important, as we've heard. It's not the whole story. Um, and trying to find a hypermobility-interested rheumatologist who will accept uh, a cardiologist's referral outside the private sector is rather difficult. Uh, and finding a non-hypermobility rheumatologist who is willing to accept that hypermobility exists is a difficult matter. Um, obviously, there's, there's lots of... Uh, I've talked... Um, I, um, on the uh, Kent hypermobility um, meeting and you can see me talk about POTS and do exactly the same talk last October on their website. So w well worth um, having a look and there's lots and lots of good videos and um, Philip Bull and his colleagues have put together some excellent information about there. There's, there's, there's also a little GP handout card which uh, I'm sure that, that he will give you. So obviously that's very important. Um, Mast cell activation syndrome causes all symptoms known to man. There is no other disease other than hypermobility, uh, than, than mast cell activation syndrome. So this comes from a review article by um, Dr. Afrin, um, and it's, it's obviously very tiny writing so that you can't see um, any of it. But um, if, again, if you look at this is what, what he says um, are the cardiovascular symptoms associated with mast cell. Uh, and again, there's a lot of POTS. Now, you might say, well, OK, that's all very difficult, and it is because there's even fewer people who believe in mast cell than who believe in POTS and hypermobility, and there are even fewer experts um, uh, around. But actually, if you do have pa patients with allergies and funny rashes and funny food intolerances and funny drug intolerances and pain, bowel pain, bladder pain. Um, there often does seem to be a mast cell related thing and you bung them on some antihistamines and they feel better. Um, and obviously there is a, there's a very uh, scientific approach that some colleagues um, will take and measure um, vast numbers of chemicals but they're often complicated and difficult and then you can take a more pragmatic view about well I'll try you on some antihistamines because they're not very dangerous like cetirizine and ranitidine and see if you feel better and if you do well that's great because you can buy them over the counter. Obviously other things come up and we're going to hear about anaesthetic and pregnancy related issues so there's lots of good stuff on the charity websites uh, worthwhile having a look and thank you for listening to my nonsense for half an hour.